Before we go into what we need, are going to discuss today, maybe you guys could introduce yourself a little bit more in depth, uh, sure. your story and the way here, the steps. Maybe Nicholas? Sure. Well, hello everyone. Happy to be here. My name is Nicholas, or Nick. Uh, I'm a senior advisor heading arts and culture at the Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies, and I also hold a UNESCO chair together with a professor at Aarhus University under the title of Anticipatory Leadership and Futures Capabilities. So what I try to do is essentially democratize the skills, tools, and methods and capabilities around the human ability to imagine the future, something that we all do every day in various ways, but that is a strange concept to many um, and something we can train and become better at. So I'm trying to wedge the conversation and representation of futures into various communities education in the civic sector, and uh, I think I'll keep it at that. Nice. Uh, Steven, maybe? Sure. My name is Steven Kersijan. I was born in Chile, um, moved to the U.S. when I was very young, and been living in Scandinavia for the last 10 years. Uh, I'm a designer, creative technologist, uh, social entrepreneur as well. I have some, a bunch of side projects that I do. Um, and, and really what I do is just solve complex problems with creativity, with technology. Um, uh, I've worked at, at Lego at the Future Lab, and I've been at IKEA running uh, disruptive innovation for the last um, three and a half years. Maiken? Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Maiken. Uh, I am a curator, uh, and I work primarily within art and technology. This is a transdisciplinary universe. Uh, so we have problems with inclusion both <laughs> within technology and within the arts. So even though it's the same theme, inclusion and empathy, the structures work in very different ways. Uh, I think I'm invited because I've always had this specific focus on um, curating works by LGBTQ plus uh, artists. So that has also always uh, sort of been a very important string in my sort of curatorial practice. Okay. To me, it's like w when I look at your different fields and the way you all work in your different fields, it's going to be so interesting to kind of go over these, uh, the, the whole idea about inclusion through the lens of participation and access. Um, today, we'll be discussing how to create a more inclusive and hopeful future um, through participation and access. Uh, kind of firstly, start off with uh, Nicholas. Um, kind of set the base on how UNESCO define inclusion and how does the definition align with your personal views uh, on inclusion? Um, UNESCO is a big multilateral organization, the, FN organ the UN organization for, um, for culture, science and education. And they have a definition that goes along the lines of the inclusion being the process of acknowledging the needs, the diversity of needs for all learners and provide access in communities, education and different cultural settings. And by doing that, reducing exclusion. Mm. I think it's hard to disagree with that. But what I then question from this is how does it look in, in practice? Because I think there's a lot mm. of talk in this field. How do you actually walk that, that talk, right? Mm. Um, and um, and how that aligned with my, my personal view on inclusion is that I think from my line of work, every time I'm in, in these spaces or hold space that's supposed to be inclusive, I sit there and often see that there's, a, that there's, there's someone missing, which mm. is future generations. We often talk about uh, intersectionality, ethnicity, disability, sexuality, and so forth, but the people that will come after us, that will live with the consequences of everything that we do, is hard for us to grasp. So I'm trying to figure out concepts and ways of working where, almost like a Trojan horse, I can, I can make sure that this representation mm. is, is in the room in, in, in my ways of working. If, if I would like include uh, Steven maybe on this, like 
taking the, because I see the marginalized groups sometimes as a community. Uh, it could be different fields, which community it is, but broadly uh, touching on that, how do you, um, do you think we can ensure that, com that marginalized communities are included in the decision making processes and have a voice in shaping their own futures maybe, mm -hmm. sort of like in a movement? Yeah, I mean, I'm sort of a believer in, in self-empowerment. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea of maybe teaching people how to fish over giving them a, a fish meal, uh, if you will. Um, and from that perspective, I think that um, the world is changing very, very rapidly. So 20 or 30 years ago, in order to be able to have access to disruptive technologies or really transformational things, you would have to be somebody like me working a <clears throat> in a lab of some big company. Um, but today, I think a, a huge disruptor is open source technologies. So open source standards it means that anybody in the world, just with a cell phone or, or, or you know, low-cost computer, can design solutions that are compatible with the global systems, right? So that really changes the access and the participation of, of, of the access to able to participate and to build the future, right? So I would say that um, the best way to have an opinion about what the future will be is to actually be an active participant in building it. And that's where I see these open source technologies yeah. enable anybody anywhere from Africa to Latin America to the developed world to sort of have a, a more level feel to be able to develop, build, design, mm -hmm. and contribute to that future. So I would say that that's a big enabler um, that uh, enables people to participate through self-empowerment instead of being invited to have an opinion about uh, whatever project's being, or whatever problem's trying to be solved. You know? to totally agree with you. Uh, and sometimes I feel like, uh, like having both your views on, uh, how, how to kind of ensure to in, include marginalized communities. It'd be interesting sometimes in art and tech um, and maybe how you could take those point of views and maybe put it in the art or tech context. Mm. Uh, I mean, I, I agree. Uh, we, I've also often worked with open source and it's, it's, a, it's a magical tool. Um, but um, the way that I've always approached it is, I mean, I've actually curated exhibitions where the theme was open source and where we tried to have every work of art be an open source technology of sorts, because that also plays a little bit with the, uh, with the work of art as being very special and very sort of exclusive. And when you actually get the source code-ish to how you can create the work at home, you also so somehow include different people and uh, provide different types of access. Sorry, uh, now I forgot your question. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's all right, because you're leading into my next question, which is uh, how do you measure the success of projects focused on increasing inclusion? Uh, and maybe this is why I wanted to fragmentize the, the, the word inclusion into access and participation, because sometimes it's more tangible to measure that. Um, can, can you guys speak about that a little bit, maybe? Access and participation. Yeah, can yeah. you measure it in some way? Ah, uh, how you measure it? Because we. I mean, I work primarily in fine arts institution, and they are always measuring, uh, but they're only measuring like how many visitors. Mm. They are not necessarily measuring who it is. Yeah. Uh, they've actually started, a lot of institutions have started measuring, at least in Denmark, that's the numbers yeah. that I know, measuring on age, like which, which age groups, because uh, you have such a low number of younger people actually being active in museums and, and cultural institutions. But that's, that's the only numbers that I know. I mean... Yeah. Um, do Nicholas and Steven, <laughs> do you have any perspective on this? Sure. sure. I mean... Measures of inclusion, um, the easy way is to look at output or heads through or people invited. But I really think it, it's important to ask who's in the room and why or who's not in the room. And then try to make some sort of critical measures of success based on that. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, it's a really difficult question, but yeah. because it is, it kind of, <laughs> I'm missing a scope. <laughs> yeah. What are we measuring success against, right? Mm -hmm think that's I actually like this question but I'll probably <coughs> maybe disrupt it a little bit and so Don't access go, and inclusion is really in. interesting um, from my uh, uh, industry or from my expertise as a designer um, again I see uh, a transformation in in 
in what good design is. So in the past, you would have more of an approach of a, a lone creative genius or you know, the designer that uh, sort of solves the problems for all of society. Um, in my career, what's made really the difference that made me sort of create a competitive edge for myself has been actually embracing open innovation and co-creation. So it's not instead, it's not replacing the creative uh, leader with uh, the crowd, but it's yes and. So when you have uh, somebody who's really talented or has a very strong skill, but then they have methods and tools to invite participation uh, for many other people to contribute to that, then you create the sort of synergy between the expert and the wisdom of the crowd. So measurement, you asked. So if you, you could, I haven't done it, um, I've seen some studies, but you could probably prove um, that by uh, using more inclusive, participatory, open innovation, co-creation methodologies, the end result of the solution, whatever problem you're trying to solve, more often than not, is going to be a better solution. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a more inclusive solution. It's going to, it's going to be solved from multiple angles that the one individual won't be able to do, no matter how talented they are. So this combination of, you know, the, the, ex the expert and the wisdom of the crowd not only provides better results, but it in, it, it integrates uh, the participation, inclusion in the process. So I really hope, I encourage a lot of designers to embrace this. So it makes sense. Which, which I, I would like to hear maybe from uh, Nicholas, if you can talk about a specific project or initiative um, that you worked on that focused, uh, that focused on solely increasing, increasing inclusion or uh, access specifically for future uh, generations, which I think it stems a little bit from what you was measuring, which is leading into the next. I think uh, working with the future, that is a constant and an omnipresent dilemma because it's not the future generations working with their future. It's the present generations mm. trying to secure their own interests or uh, whatever they prescribe value to in the present, right? So what you see the problem uh, or, or a challenge here is to change some sort of mindset when people are working with the future and not trying and not trying to force fit what we already have onto the future for something to continue to exist, but actually invert that process to mm -hmm. think up an ideal future mm -hmm. and look back to the present from that and start asking questions, what would that look like? Mm -hmm. um, so in almost every process, whether it's, it's with students or it's a corporate organization, you need to uh, make sure that these things are addressed from the get-go. What is the purpose? Well, how do you, wh why do you lean yourself into the future? Is it from a perspective of competition, scarcity, or abundance? Um, and the reason why these things are important to outline is because if you don't do it, you end up just reinforcing the very dominant narratives or dominant mm -hmm. images that currently exist. Um, and, uh, and then we can get into a conversation about that, uh, about colonizing the future or the images mm. of the future that we have. Mm. Um, so in, a, in another way, it's about diversifying the images of the future. Mm. T talking about images, um, uh, Mike, and are there any specific artists or organizations, maybe collectives in, in art or tech, maybe both, uh, that you believe are doing a particularly good job at creating inclusive representation in contemporary art or tech. Could be a device or innovation as well, you know, that's opening up I the... Mean, I would like to start at a different place because yeah. I think we touched a little, I, I talked a little bit about it before and I'd like to sort of talk a little bit more about it because when we talk about art institutions or cultural institutions in general, you often uh, consider inclusion to be getting a more diverse audience. Uh, trying to get like audiences through the door that has the access. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's the access part. But I think if you really want to create an inclusive sort of cultural landscape, you have to also consider the artists that you curate. Like, who do you allow to be on the walls? Whose voices do you sort of emphasize and bring to the table? And last, and I think that maybe binds into your, what you were saying, Nick, a little bit. Uh, you also have to think about who is actually hired, uh, who, who is working, who is getting to curate, who is getting to hold the power inside of these institutions. And um, 
I saw an amazing uh, documentary, now I'm coming to your question, yeah, yeah. Uh, about uh, a museum in uh, Holland called the Stedelijk Museum. Uh, yeah. It's in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. And they've worked intensively with their curatorial process, uh, not only thinking about the art on the walls, but also what story do these uh, works that they have on the walls tell? For instance, they did a big show with modernist paintings uh, where they, uh, these male uh, artists uh, that are very hailed as these geniuses uh, and they had painted a lot of uh, female and uh, non-white uh, characters in their images, this uh, fetish object of theirs and the curators had tried to figure out who were these women, which they often were, like these women of color, where did they come from? What what was their story? And that was what you saw on display. You saw the you saw the painting, you saw the art object, but you also were told the story about these women. So they went from being these anonymous, just like fetish objects, to actually being human beings with a story. And they've also uh, changed the way that they hire people. They really had a specific emphasis on having a very multidisciplinary. Uh, both in terms of age and of color in the, their curatorial team. So I think it, it, the, the, the movie is called White Balls on Walls and it's, a, it's, a, it's an old slogan from the Guerrilla Girls. I don't know if anyone knows the Guerrilla Girls, but they, uh, it's, a, it's an activist group, a female artist who uh, has been active like for 20, 30 years. And uh, the reason why they had this slogan was because uh, I think it's still 97% of, of the art that we look upon uh, when we enter a museum is still created by men. Mm. So it's white balls on walls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, which is interesting that you uh, mentioned in like, because uh, I think the way you broke down everything right now, it can kind of go straight into the idea of like, sometimes you have access to some place, you can go through a space uh, who was going through it, wh how did they go through it, mm. uh, how easy was it, how easy was it not, and sometimes you know, who's participating in the space, which I think you really summed it up uh, really great, which leads into Steven. Um, the ability sometimes or disability of designing or uh, uh, the elements in it, uh, can you speak maybe to the role of design in ensuring access and participation for all individuals, regardless of ability or disability? Yeah, again, again, I go back to this, to this model of creating methodologies that are very inviting for the participation of the, the diverse people that are going to be in, interacting with the solution, right? So um, uh, abilities, disabilities, of course, we should be designing with, uh, if we're designing somebody f uh, a solution for somebody that has a, some limitation or disability, those people should be participating in the process um, somehow. Um, and I think the role that uh, artists or designers or even but entrepreneurs... I, can I ask you something? Yes. Because I, I was just reading this uh, article about uh, design, design methodologies, yes. where the writers, the authors were criticizing this classic design methodology of like including people in the process, opening up the mm -hmm. design process, what the, the, um, this method that every designer today is using. Because she, they were writing about Detroit, where they had had a lot of city development, and designers came out and like, oh, let me engage you people of Detroit in this process, and they did like fancy design processes, and then they left, uh, and they actually argued that we need to take it a, a step even further. We cannot have a designer as a lead in these processes. We have to have the participants, this inhabitants, in this case it was citizens of Detroit, they have to be the lead designers in yeah, the So the role of the designer projects. would be to make sure that the process is enabling the moving forward of the ideas, the development of the yeah. ideas and the solutions. So the role of the designer is really that, is, that needs to change in order yeah. to, to be able to function. Let me give you a very specific example because you know, we're sitting in Sweden and uh, we're very smart. We have access to a lot of information and all these fancy methodologies and all these cool things. Um, but there's harsh, really almost opposed uh, uh, experiences when it comes to, let's take something like um, personal data. Uh, 
Mm. Personal data for most of the people here is something that is something well, it's, it's very private. I don't want uh, big corporations uh, following me or knowing what I'm doing. The perspective is to protect my personal data and to keep it very close to me. If you go to India, personal data is, it, it, I'm generalizing of course, it's completely different. Personal data is almost seen as a currency something that I can use to access a service or to access internet or to access. So the perception of that same thing is viewed completely different. I think they are actually the same because both of these uh, groups you mentioned, they consider data to be something of value. Sure. Either it's a personal value or it's something I can sell. I would actually argue that data is something different. Data is relational because you always have someone who produces the data you have someone who provides data to someone and you have someone who sets the tone for what data that needs to be gathered. So data is relational. It's very different to, to, to distinguish between if I ask you a question and you generate an answer, is it then your data or mine? I ask the question and you provide the answer. Who owns the data? And it's a wonderful conversation to have. That the mm. point that I'm trying to make is if you're trying to design solutions that are based on the assumption that I'm trying to protect my data and, and keep it close to me, you're basically designing from, a, from the wrong perspective. If you're designing something for, for a global solution, if you're designing for the third world or for India or China. So how do we become more sensitive, more empathetic to the different perspectives of something as benign as data, something, you know, data is something, it's, it's, it's an inanimate object. So the perception of, of how we use the tools in order to make sure that we're including completely different experiences uh, is something that it, the process should be able to facilitate. So then the, the role of the designer is really to make sure that the process enables these things to come through and not be sort of like the leader about like my vision or my mm. ideology of where I want to get. So I, I've, I've, I've almost seen like in myself, the way I was taught design is almost, it doesn't really work for today. So I'm really interested in education, seeing like how do we evolve the practice uh, in, in real time with the technology and the diversity and in a globalized world. It's very, it's, it's, uh, it's very difficult um, to, to, uh, to, to uh, change the methodologies in real time because uh, the, the world changes faster than, mm. the, than the industry or the Problems methodology or the education changes. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Nick and maybe I actually taught a course yeah. where maybe we should touch upon that a little bit. Yeah. We, 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 uh, we, we were, uh, we taught a course at the IT University of Copenhagen, and it was about entrepreneurship, but from a sort of a creative point of view. Uh, we wanted the students to actually design IT products from a different place. We tried to, because they've all been taught sort of this uh, design method where we need to engage people, but we wanted them to take a step further and actually, <laughs> actually lead with empathy more. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So what we did was that we triangulated entrepreneurship studies, future studies and contemporary art yeah. and gave them <laughs> that as a lens to view systemic issues and try to innovate on the back of that. And a key word you said before is assumptions. So what you want to do early on in this process is to reveal all the assumptions that are in the room to then start pinpointing what yeah. do we actually want to work with here? Can we, can we widen the space? What do I presume that is my worldview and is yours different? Yeah. Um, so, so this was a very effective process in revealing unconscious bias in the room, which gave way for a much more wholesome yeah. ideation process, I would and, say. And the products that were developed through this course were different than has ever been developed at the IT right. University. It was Makes really sense. a lot of fun. Yeah. Makes sense. But I think if I, if I would take everything in, it's like the, the world is like changing fast, like you said, and like the roles we've, we've been had is becoming kind of obsolete because the problems are so complex that you sometimes need uh, the, the people you're solving the problems for, you kind of need them to be in the, in the lab which you, because they have the insights some, sometimes, if I'm kind of summing everything up. At the same time, I'm trying to keep us on, on schedule. So of course. I, w <laughs> I would love to keep having the conversation together with you. Uh, I know that the three of you in a conversation like this will be very interesting. And I think this conversation will be able to go for hours. Uh, but I want to thank you all for, uh, for coming, for joining us. Uh, and I hope uh, that this uh, talk is something you guys can bring it, uh, with you and maybe have it as a base for looking uh, inclusion in a different way, maybe. May I? 
Nicholas. So I just have something I want to share before we end this. I, uh, I launched a project earlier today with uh, Philea, Philanthropy Europe Association, on getting futures thinking into the civic sector. Here, we had a breakout room that also focused on inclusion, and I was introduced to this amazing concept that I just look forward to share with you. This Italian foundation is trying to starting their futuring process, making sure the future is present in what they do and how they can consider interests and rights for future generations. Very difficult abstract questions because we don't know what they would want, how they would look like, what their priorities would be. So how would you consider that in everything that you do? Have an empty chair at every meeting where you need to take critical decisions. And that particular chair will ask you questions by just looking at it. It will speak to your consciousness, it will speak to your empathy, and you'll probably get some really good insights out of this. I love it, the yeah. empty chair The method. empty chair empty representing future <laughs> generations. Yeah. Well, random applause for the panelists. Thank you so much.